light. And of course, if you, you can't see this with your eye, oops, I'm gonna add, put on a little laser pointer here. Um, you can't see this with your eye, but of course with a nice long photographic exposure, uh, you can see that band of, of light going across the sky, which is of course our, the disk of our own Milky Way galaxy seen edge on because we're in the middle of it. Um, and of course, one of the goals of my career has been trying to reconstruct what it might look like if you could get outside of it. Um, that actually uh, turned into uh, this, this picture. Um, so this is an artist picture in 2008. It's getting a little long in the tooth. Um, so I, I look at it and I see all the things that need fixing. Um, and actually invite me back in a, another few, four, three or four years and I'll, I can probably share with you a revised version of this picture. Um, because surprisingly, this picture has held up pretty well over the years. Um, but there are some, there's, a, there's at least one thing that has just made me sort of say, okay, it's time. It's time to fix it up. Uh, so I'm actually in the process of starting that procedure, uh, trying to get people together uh, and figure out how, how do we do a better job the next time around. Um, but that's not the topic of this talk. That's a future talk. So invite me back. So again, here is uh, sort of the picture of the Milky Way. And what you mostly see um, when you look at this, you know, with our, our normal vision is, um, is starlight. Um, and uh, particularly uh, towards this inner part of the Milky Way, you can see a lot of stars blurring together. So you see these bright patch near the center of the galaxy. Uh, but you also see darkness. Uh, you see these dark lanes um, of, these are dust clouds most of them quite nearby. I mean, they're, they're actually very close to the sun and blocking the light um, you know, of everything behind them. Um, and so that dust has always been the enemy in galactic structure because of course we can't see through it with optical telescopes, but we can see through it with radio telescopes, infrared telescopes. And that's how the artist picture I showed in the previous slide you know, came to be, um, is mostly through the combination of infrared and radio telescopes. Um, but, but what you're seeing here is mostly the stars. And what I'm going to focus on uh, in this talk is, uh, is research I've done on the gas. And not just any gas. Uh, the hyd We're talking, of course, when I say gas, hydrogen gas mostly. Uh, the interstellar medium is the gas and dust in between the stars. And the, the gas is you know 90% uh, by atoms hydrogen, a little under 10% by atoms helium, and then a trace amount of things like carbon oxygen and nitrogen atoms. And if you were to look at the, um, the emission uh, from, this, from this entire all sky image, but in gas, if you were to look at the, at the radiation coming from the ionized hydrogen, and I'll explain what ionized means in more detail, but basically uh, when hydrogen atoms are exposed to radiation, the electron can be pulled apart from the proton. Uh, and then when it falls back in, it emits uh, a light um, indicating you, that, that there's ionized gas there. So, uh, so this is the uh, so if we were to look at this with uh, still optical light, but in the in a certain wavelength of light, the uh, the H alpha wavelength, uh, this is what the sky looks like. And uh, now, so I'm just going to blink it because actually there are some places where if you look at the original image, like over here. Um, you might see a little hint of red uh, in some of these images. And so there, there's every, every now and then, like over here where I've got my, my mouse right there, uh, you know, there are a little hint in this image I'm showing, but it comes out booming when you just, basically we use what's called a narrow band filter um, and only select the emission line of hydrogen. Um, now what you're seeing here is actually very low, very faint light levels. Um, so it's much, much fainter than the starlight I was showing before. Uh, but you know, with a narrowband filter of H alpha, uh, you can see that the, uh, mostly what you're seeing here are regions of ionized gas uh, lit up by hot stars. Uh, most of them are nearby because again, it's optical light. And, um, and, uh, and so one of my goals in my research is to understand the distribution of this gas. Uh, so I'm going to share with you a couple discoveries about this, this gas that I'm seeing. In particular, um, uh, something we discovered in this direction, right towards galactic center, uh, something up here in the, in the upper left-hand corner, and, uh, and then, oh yeah, and then something um, about 10 degrees up and 10 degrees to the left of galactic center, so some ionized gas here. 
So I'll share you those discoveries. And um, I, I actually am going to break at certain points. So if people have questions about the different things I'm saying, you know, we can, we can, I'm not, not at all unhappy to answer questions part, part way through. So, um, so because I'm a, I'm a eat your dessert first kind of guy, uh, I'm going to put the other surprises first. <laughs> Uh, and then I'll go back to the, uh, the, the, the mysterious Milky Way field. Um, so, so, so basically I'll talk about other surprises, then I'll talk a little bit more about ionized gas than I already have. I'm gonna talk about discovery of what's called a liner in the inner Milky Way, and then discovery of optical emission from a structure in the center of the Milky Way galaxy, uh, shown in this sort of rotating kiosk here. When you see these bubbles coming out of the center of the galaxy, uh, this is something called the Fermi bubble. It's seen in gamma rays, but we've detected it, we think, in ionized gas as well. And I'll tell you the significance of that. Um, so other surprises. Um, the, the surprise uh, was that uh, working with two postdocs that I met during my sabbatical, um, we published a paper on the discovery of a beautiful 30 degree arc of ionized gas in the sky. Um, so this this arc this is just superimposed on a on a stellarium um, image of the sky. Um, when I when I realized, but by, by the way, so so it was my collaborators that found this. Uh, well, there, actually, there's a bit of a backstory there. I'll tell you in a second. But it was my collaborators that found it was 30 degrees long, um, and I, but I was the one that actually first plotted it up and realized that as a circle, if you were to continue this circle. Um, this full circle would be, have a diameter of 60 degrees on the sky, and it's centered on the handle of the Big Dipper. <laughs> and so I thought, well, that that writes its own press release, doesn't it? Uh, that 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 uh, that that arc is pretty pretty easy for people to imagine where it is. Um, so uh, so it this the story of this discovery actually has the story goes back to 2001 on a paper I published with another scientist. We had discovered a tiny little segment, a little straight line of H alpha in the sky. Um, it was uh, Peter introduced it to me as we were at a meeting. This is Peter McCullough was my collaborator on that 2001 paper. Um, we were actually at a meeting in Green Bank uh, in West Virginia, and we were taking a walk during like one of the lunch breaks. And a plane flew overhead, and Peter said, "You know, what would you say if I told you I saw something that looks like that jet contrail, but in H alpha?" And I said, "Well, Peter, I would say, tell me more." <laughs> and uh, and so he did, um, and I couldn't stop thinking about it. And so after the meeting, I wrote to Peter and said, "Peter, could I help you interpret that? I mean, because it was just so it's just struck me that a straight line of H alpha across the sky, two and a half degrees long, was pretty cool." And I wanted to see if I could figure out what it was. And so we worked together. We didn't definitively um, come up with an idea. We thought it might be a trail of ionized gas left behind by a low luminosity ionizing source, like a white dwarf star, for instance. Um, so that this, the straight line was just the, the trail that had been left behind. But we never found the ionizing source. And, um, and uh, we, you know, we threw out other options. But we, we didn't know, but we published the paper anyway. And, uh, and then 20 years later, uh, when these postdocs were the same age I was when I did the original paper, uh, Andrea Bracco and Marta Alves came to me at a meeting. And they said, Bob, you know that, that straight line of H alpha you found in 2001? And actually, it was found by Peter um, with his, uh, it's actually a set of uh, experimental optics he was doing in his garage. He actually wasn't doing this at an observatory, uh, but he, um, he actually uh, found it in 97. Uh, and so Andrea and Marta said, you know that thing you found? Um, we found it again, um, but we didn't find it in H alpha. We didn't find it in optical light. We found it in ultraviolet light. Um, so it turned out it was lying in a NASA archive um, that data had been public for 10 years, and no one had found it uh, until uh, Andrea and Marta found it. Uh, they showed their respective colleagues and advisors, and for some reason, none of the, her, their colleagues seemed interested in it. So when they brought it to me, it was like, wow, we got to publish this. And so, so it was really fun working with Andrea and Marta. Uh, Marta has now uh, left uh, the field, unfortunately. She's gone into a, a career in space science uh, in France. And Andrea is actually a uh, second postdoc in uh, Croatia. Um, but working with them uh, for this, the basically half year or so after they, we met at the meeting has been, was tremendously fun. 
So um, again, just to give you a sense of the scale of it, here's uh, the Big Dipper, here's the Little Dipper. Uh, the arc I'm talking about actually crosses through the handle of the Big Dipper, uh, sorry, of the Little Dipper. Um, this is the galactic plane, um, and then 60 degrees would be sort of this diameter. So it actually covers, if, if you believe this arc um, is, is actually covering, indicates a circle of radius of diameter 60 degrees, it covers about one third of the sky um, north of the galactic plane, well, north of about 30 degrees above the galactic plane. So it's, it's a big area, um, and, and that's unusual. I, don't, I mean, there's nothing else like that that people have found in astronomy. Um, so here is the data. Um, so, this is the, um, so this is actually showing um, the galactic coordinates, galactic longitude and galactic latitude. So this is just height, a, a, a angle along the galactic plane, and then how many degrees above the galactic plane. And you can sort of see it uh, going from here. Um, and then now the, ga the, the NASA GALAX mission, which is the ultraviolet telescope that found it, um, didn't, didn't cover every single patch of the sky. They had to avoid certain sections of the sky when there were super bright ultraviolet sources, it would have burned out the detector. So, so the, their coverage is a little bit patchy, but you can see it goes along here and it keeps going and going and going. Um, and actually, like I said, it ends up being about 30 degrees of arc. Um, and as it turns out, perfectly circular. We found it in two different um, channels. Uh, so we found it in the far ultraviolet, which is um, 130 to 180 nanometers as NASA defined it, and the near ultraviolet, um, so 170 to 280 nanometers. And of course, we had originally found a piece of it in H alpha back in the, in the two, well, 97, 2000. Uh, the, the piece we found was this little section up here, but it kept on going. And I, I sometimes I kick myself because I, you know, we, I could have been doing this 20 years ago if I had just encouraged Peter to let's let's keep searching, you know, let's keep going along this arc. But we we just stuck with the two and a half degrees we found and then let, called it a day. Um, this is another way of displaying it. It's basically what we take the gradient, so so it, it enables us to see it a little more clearly all the way over to this point. Um, so there's this big circular arc in the sky. Now, I, again, I want to emphasize it's very faint, um, very faint, and it's and it's ionized gas. So this again, um, right here, this was the original discovery image uh, taken in 1997. What you're seeing. Here here is a what's so-called background or a, um, a, a continuum subtracted H alpha image. So you take a, 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 an image of the sky just in H alpha, and then you take an image of the sky at wavelengths just slightly up, away from a, the H alpha line, and then you subtract that to try to subtract out all the stars. Uh, the stars are subtracted in, uh, imperfectly, and so that's why it looks sort of like a, I don't know, like, like a blow up of sandpaper there. Uh, but the main thing to see is you can see this dark streak. And again, when Peter found this, he thought it must be a mistake. <laughs> he thought it must be a flaw in his optics. And then he went to another telescope, and there it was uh, in the other telescope. So this was the paper on the right that we published. Um, and we speculated about it. We described it, and we gave our possible explanations for it. Um, and I should say that the fun, one of the fun things about this paper, I used to joke about this paper at meetings with friends, uh, because I would say, you know, this is the only paper I've ever published in my entire career that has zero citations. Um, and no one ever referred to this paper. And the reason no one ever referred to this paper is because it doesn't look like anything that anyone else has ever seen. So why would you refer to it? <laughs> and I said, I would joke with my friends like, so this is my zero citation paper. It's, in terms of scientific impact, it's had none. And, uh, and yet I suspect it will be one of my most important discoveries <laughs> someday when we understand it. And so now I don't know if it's my, one of my most important discoveries, but it's certainly one of the most fun ones. Uh, and so what prompted uh, Marta in particular to reobserve this uh, was that uh, we actually mentioned in this paper, we mentioned for reasonable interstellar parameters, the filament described here could produce Faraday depolarization. Now the details of that are unimportant, but the point was what we were doing is we were predicting that it could be observed with a radio telescope and that radio telescope could shed more information on the, the nature of the filament. And so Marta decided to observe it with a radio telescope, the so-called LOFAR telescope in the Netherlands. Um, 
And the reason that uh, Andrea and Marta together found it is because the LOFAR data didn't really show very much. It was very hard to interpret. And so Andrea started looking at other wavelengths to see if he could find the object in other wavelengths. And so, so that was how they came to discover it in the ultraviolet data. Now, I mentioned that we originally found this, this first section of it uh, in H-alpha back in the 2000s. Um, and uh, this, the, and you know, this section, you can, well, I won't say anything about this section, but you know, now that we can see it in H-alpha, we thought, well, can we find an H a, a modern H-alpha survey of the sky that we can confirm that it goes as far as we see it in the ultraviolet, just to confirm that it, it really is H-alpha as well as ultraviolet along its entire length. Um, what was fun about that is it turns out that um, the only survey we were aware of that went to, uh, that had a high enough resolution so you could resolve the fine, the fine feature of it, but also long enough and deep enough exposure um, was actually done by a group of amateur astronomers. Um, now, I have to say that they're a little high end. Uh, we're talking about a former editor of Sky and Telescope magazine, and, uh, and then someone who still works uh, doing graphics for them, um, and then a colleague there. So there was three of them together, and they decided to create their own H-alpha survey of the sky. Uh, they, they actually set up a little telescope in New Mexico that they could robotically control, and they have continued to uh, do this H-alpha survey of the sky, this so-called MDW survey. So I contacted them and I said, could you please get your images and stretch them really hard to see if you can see this feature? And sure enough, um, they had it in their survey. So each of these is a four by four degree field. Um, so they actually had it in their survey. And so we were able to confirm it in H-alpha. So, so when we published this paper, we actually used a contribution from a group of amateur astronomers doing their own survey of the sky, um, which was sort of fun. Um, so basic characteristics of it, it's like I said, 30 degrees. Uh, this doesn't mean so much, but it, that, those are its coordinates. Um, one of the interesting things is it seems to break into little arcs. So it's not a perfectly circular thing. Sometimes there's these little segments that are sort of offset, um, but generally they all follow this major arc. Um, it's a 60 degree radius. And what makes it really unique compared to anything else we've seen in astronomy is it's incredibly thin. I mean, it sort of looks like someone just laid a protractor down in the sky and did a, an arc with the, and slipped occasionally. Um, but that thinness of it really differentiates it from any kind of shell or arc uh, that astronomers have seen in other wavelengths. Um, now, given the fact that this was lurking in the Galax data, um, we thought, um, you know, is, is, are there other ones out there? And so we did do a cursory look uh, through all of the Galax survey, just seeing if we could find more. And we did find a few more arcs, nothing as dramatic as this one, um, but there do seem to be a large, uh, well, a moderate number, maybe a dozen or so of these sort of arcs in the sky uh, seen in, in Galax, um, all of which are not really attached to anything that we know. Um, so, but I'll tell you a little bit more about this one. And the source of the ultraviolet emission, it turns out, is what's called two-photon emission. From It's all hydrogen gas. Um, I'll say a little bit more about hydrogen H-alpha in a minute. Um, but it turns out when electrons recombine with hydrogen atoms, where they, they basically jump from energy level to energy level, when they reach the second energy level and they want to fall to the first energy level and release more photons, they can't. Um, because to fall from the second level, or at least one of the substates of the second level to the first, uh, all, all photons carry angular momentum, and that transition is no angular momentum. Uh, but it turns out nature has found a way to get an electron from level two to level one by emitting two photons of ultraviolet light. Um, and so that's what we're seeing in the sky. So what is it? Um, well, uh, you know, we think it's a, basically evidence of an old, very, very nearby supernova remnant, something that happened to explode 60 degrees above the plane of the galaxy and sent out a shock wave. And for, for whatever reason, we can still see part of that shock. Probably that shock is going through a pre-existing low density medium. So it didn't crash into anything and disrupt the shock front. Um, and the reason we think that is mostly by analogy. It turns out that over the, over the last several years, well, actually over the last 20 years, but, but more, most, most of them found just in the last uh, several years, uh, you can actually see these very large angular size supernova remnants in the sky. Uh, so the, what's shown here is the MDW survey on the left here, 
of a, a supernova remnant called G70 minus 21.5. That's just means 70 degrees of galactic longitude and 20 degrees below the galactic plane. Uh, this particular remnant has a diameter of eight degrees. Um, it does contain X-ray emissions, so we know that it definitely is, seems to have hot gas embedded in it. Um, and um, and if you look at the at the H alpha, it has the same kind of uh, appearance as the filament we see or the the arc we see, and you can also see it in the galax emission. And you can see when you look at dust and 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 neutral gas, there's a big hole. Uh, by the way, the hole's not terribly obvious, but that black means that probably when this thing exploded, it cleared out a region inside. Um, this seems to be a growing class of remnants. I mean, I had sort of noticed a few of them. I thought, eh, you know, someone really ought to do something with those. Uh, so finding the Ursa Major arc, uh, which, which was our name for it, uh, has really sort of pushed me over the edge. So I'm, I'm trying, trying to collect, understand these as a collection of objects that basically very old, very evolved nearby explosions uh, near the sun. And, uh, and so, a couple of implications. Um, first of all, it's big. And it turns out that if you look at this direction in the sky, uh, the, this direction in the sky is characterized by the, the least amount of gas of any direction you can look in. In other words, actually people who study uh, galaxies uh, beyond our own Milky Way, they frequently use uh, a region here called Lachman Hole or a region here called the Growth Strip. Um, these are basically considered extragalactic windows places where you can observe other galaxies without having contamination from our own Milky Way galaxy. So, so the idea that you had an explosion here clearing out a big, a big area of sky, it basically opened up a window for us to look out of the Milky Way. So, uh, so that's one of the potential implications. Um, and, and we do think that we may, uh, now one, one thing we don't know, um, we, have, we've, we have a very, very indirect argument for how far away it is. Um, because there is a cloud uh, inside it, uh, at least with in projection, that looks as if, if it's been shocked by a, a, a blast wave from a supernova remnant, something called the Draco cloud. And we actually do have a distance to that. Um, and so if that Draco cloud is inside this bubble, uh, then the, uh, the radius of this thing is about 300 light years and the distance to the center of it is about 600 light years sort of above the plane of the galaxy. Um, that's a pretty squishy estimate. Um, it's the only thing we have to go on because again, it's so faint. And if we could better get a sense of what the velocity of the, of the shell was, we might be able to make progress on it. But because it's so huge on the sky, it's hard to really, you know, it's hard to pick out the forest for all the trees is the fundamental problem with this. So, um, so I'm gonna skip over that. So at any rate, this is actually um, showing an X-ray image um, that some of you may be aware there's a, a, a X-ray telescope that has been launched into space. It's a combination. It's a joint program between the Germans and the Russians. Uh, so they, they released their public release image. Uh, I, because this is a German-Russian thing, Americans don't get, to pack, don't get to play with the data, at least not for many years. Um, so we're all desperately analyzing like the press release images. <laughs> So I superimpose some of these uh, supernova remnants on this image. Uh, some of these have been known for years, but uh, several of them are new. Um, I'm waiting for the German side. By the way, there's an, almost a, a Cold War kind of thing going on here. Uh, the, basically, the Germans and the Russians have divided the sky in half. And uh, so the left side of this image bel belongs to the Russians. Uh, that's mostly the side that you can see from the Northern Hemisphere and the right side of the image belongs to the Germans. And then there's a little bit of a demilitarized zone right along galactic center where they both have access to the data. And um, so someday I will be able to look at these things in higher angular resolution x-rays and see if we can see evidence of hot gas in these because this, this uh, x-ray survey actually um, is a lot better uh, than a, 19, a late 1990s or early 1990s project called ROSAT. Uh, that was launched into space, you know, back back then. So, so I'm looking forward to doing more with this. Um, but for the time being, I, I, I can wait. <laughs> I waited 20 years for the first part. So, uh, so at any rate, so the short end of this is that that two degree uh, straight and narrow filament was actually less straight than we thought. Um, it's a 30 degree long curved shock front, 
uh, indicating a 60 diameter, degree diameter old supernova remnant covering the sky. Uh, this is much bigger than any previously known supernova remnant in angular size. Uh, some of you may know something called the Cygnus loop. It's four times larger than that. Uh, we don't know the distance and the age, but we estimate a roughly 100,000 years old, 600 light years away. And it's probably related to the fact that this is a direction of in the sky of very low extinction, very low dust content uh, that people use to study things in the out galaxy. So this will probably be my only discovery that can be actually plotted on a state flag. Um, so this actually shows where uh, the, the discovery would lie, roughly the scale on the map on a, the state flag of Alaska. So. Um, so before I, I um, go on, I'm going to just quickly stop and just see if there's any questions on that. Because uh, we do have a question. Uh, Bob, go ahead, Will. Sure. Um, so the first question I had, well, initially I actually posited that maybe it was a supernova remnant. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'll just shoot both of my questions and go that way. If, if it is a supernova remnant, are there any other uh, possible trace elements that we could see uh, see from the remnant, or would all of those have, uh, or, or is the remnant so old that any rem any other elements that would have been contained within the initial explosion are just not visible at this point? Yeah, I mean, all the the fresh the set the, the like the freshly synthesized material that would have been created. I mean, at an age of a hundred thousand years, which is our best guess, um, it would all have been sort of dispersed and mixed in. So yeah. <laughs> We don't have, we don't, it would, I don't think it's something that we could detect. Another thing we've tried to do is we've tried to link um, basically pulsars and neutron stars um, to, to, you know, if we could find something whose motion across the sky indicated it started, you know, at that location where the center is, we might have, you know, we could link it to an actual remnant, but uh, that hasn't worked either. So hard to get a hold of. Yeah, yeah. And then my, my second question is regarding the distance. Um, one thing I've become more familiar with, you know, on the, the amateur side of things, imaging in the Ursa major areas, basically if you expose for long enough, you're going to pick up some integrated flux nebula at some point. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know the distance, if we can get a distance measurement to IFN, but I'm wondering if we can get a distance measurement to IFN, could we look for interactions between this shock wave and any of the IFN to possibly uh, kind of triangulate a distance that way. Yeah, so I, I know the nebula of which you speak there, and um, and I you know I I remember at one point really trying to figure out what was going on there, and then but I I I I, I haven't gotten back around to that, so I'm going to write that down because. <laughs> You know, sometimes you don't get things on the first try. I mean, I think this discovery is an example of it. <laughs> and uh, and so so I'll, I'll actually, if I find anything with, with, uh, that might relate this to the IFN, I'll let you know. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Bob, the thing that I wanted to go back to is you, you kind of glossed over quickly that Peter McCullough initially observed this HA artifact with uh -huh. something he built in his garage. Yes. You can't let that go by and not like, what was this guy doing in his garage? Well, he was, I mean, Peter, before he became a professional astronomer, was an amateur astronomer. And, 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 you know, I think the thing was, is he, he wanted basically a, um, a wide field H alpha camera. And so he just sort of got some parts and was experimenting. I mean, like I said, the, this, this can be picked up by amateur astronomers with the right equipment and, and long exposure times. I mean, that was what the MDW survey was. So Peter was essentially was just sort of said, well, I think I'll just play around with this. Um, found this, he, the reason he pointed it where he did is because um, he was actually had read about um, the galaxies M81 and M82. Uh, they actually have, you know, there's a, these are uh, two galaxies. They have a lot of neutral gas sort of surrounding them as a, as a common envelope of neutral gas. And Peter thought, well, I, I wonder if they have an ionized envelope as well. So that's why he pointed in this his his wide field camera in this direction. But this this straight line is what he got instead. It's a great uh, story. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, Bob, uh, you had indicated that the uh, arclets uh, are that there's interruptions in the arc itself. Yeah. Uh, is and I think you inferred that 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 the interruptions may have been caused by 
the um, emissions actually hitting something, some some objects on the way. Are there is there any evidence of uh, uh, of actual objects that would have caused those interruptions? No, no. For for the the little ripples that we see, um, you know, that we don't see any evidence of things they're interacting with. But as it turns out, um, when you look at supernova remnants, and I, I should have maybe blown up the, ex, the, the like the, the example one I was showing, the G seventy minus twenty one point five. Um, but you know, the the that sh the shock waves tend to be very thin, and they're 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 not perfectly. They're, they're they have slight ripples, and so when the ripples line up with our line of sight, they get bright, and when they don't line up with our line of sight, they they're faint. It's called limb brightening. And so, so that that slight rippling of the shock front is what gives you the sort of occasionally some misaligned little little filaments. It's, it indicates that the shock wave is not perfectly circular. Yeah. Well, yeah. if it was perfectly circular, that means we would have been looking down on the um, the rotation, correct? Which means we would have been burned out by the gamma rays from the supernova, right? <laughs> Actually, I oh crap! I I when I when we did the press release, I I thought someone is going to ask me how how close is it you know if you if you assume that there's a front side to it how close mm -hmm. is it to us now yeah. and i i forgot i calculated how long it would you know how far how far along the path do i think the shock front made it i think it was basically half the distance um between us and the center of the explosion so we have so, some time before the end of the world yeah, no, I mean, by this point, the thing is stalled anyway. I mean, it, we, it's, we don't see any evidence that it's expanding very rapidly now. We think it's nearly come to a stop. And uh, so, so it's basically, we're safe. That, oh. that, we're, we're safe from that one. <laughs> so anyway, so I'll go ahead and continue on then, because I, I wanted to share at least one other discovery. Um, the, um, the, the, um, I think the thing that I want to emphasize about this first thing is, even though it's huge on the sky, it's actually small for a galactic thing. I mean, because it's close, right? It's right up in our face. So it occupies a, a large angle. Uh, so what I'm gonna tell you now is about something that's much smaller in the sky, but it turns out it's a much bigger section of the galaxy. And I'm gonna race through this introduction to ionized gas. I apologize for this, but uh, mm -hmm. just for those people who, uh, just maybe for some people who don't know how ionized gas works and have I frozen? Hmm. I have seemed to have um, okay, let's try exiting. Okay, I see. Okay, I'm gonna try to exit and then start back in again. Um sorry about that. No problem. <laughs> it's worth waiting for. Okay. Now I've lost you. <laughs> well, you're puzzling over that. Can I ask one question that you can? Uh, is there any evidence of any sort of SNR of any remnant? Have they looked for anything at all? I mean, if you have an arc, you can kind of localize where the center would be. Mm -hmm. And uh, have they have they looked for that at all? Will they be looking for something? Well, in, in I think. Wavelength? Yeah, I mean, we we did do a, an examination of center, but again, because it's so big on the sky, I mean, we know the center sort of within a degree, but a degree is a lot of area um, of the sky, and so so it's you know it's something that um, it, it's it's angular size just makes it really hard to study because it takes in so much of the of the entire sky. So I think I think that the bottom line that I know that's probably unsatisfying, but we don't really see any any anything on. At the location of the center, we don't see anything unusual. So. Okay, so let me talk about ionized gas and how you make it generally. Um, gen some of you may know that the way ionized gas is thought to occur in the galaxy is you start off with a star, okay? It's a hot star, what we call an O star. And, um, and that star emits radiation. And that radiation um, basically produces a bubble of ionized gas around the star. Um, and so that uh, bubble, an example of that bubble is shown here. This is actually a glimpse image. Uh, so, and, and what you're seeing is uh, basically a region of ionized gas. Um, uh, the, the, the green is actually the boundary. 
And then the red here is actually not showing um, the ionized gas, it's actually showing warm dust interior to the bubble. Um, and that was sort of the classic H2 region. Uh, H2, by the way, just means H, two, Roman numeral two, means it's the hydrogen uh, atom with the electron removed, ionized hydrogen. So at any rate, um, but it turns out that these H2 regions are not sort of, are permeable. In other words, it's possible for the, the, the radiation to come out from the star and then sort of leak out of this region. And you can actually see that that might happen in this one because there's a little bit of a, it's not a perfect circle. There's a place where it seems to have punched through a little bit. And that would be a place um, where the radiation is leaking out. Um, so, so some of these I, this, this radiation that would ionize the hydrogen, that would has enough energy to remove the electron, uh, can actually escape the boundaries of these H2 regions and fill the, the volume of interstellar space. And, uh, and because some regions of star formation are very complex, you can get this basically leaking out in all directions and get a, lot, a fraction of the radiation from these other stars escaping into the, the, the general interstellar medium. So when this gas is created, okay, when this ionized gas is, um, is produced, um, it's, that it's warm. Uh, and I be, by the way, in, in, in astronomer lingo, warm means um, 8,000 degrees Kelvin. <laughs> so, uh, so it, and it has a very low density. So we're talking about gas that's very low density and it's ionized by these O stars. Um, and so what happens to the ionized gas is as electrons uh, try to come back into the hydrogen atom, uh, some of those electrons will go from the so-called n equals three orbit of an atom down to the n equals two. And then that produces a photon of a particular wavelength called H alpha. And so when I take it, talk about H alpha, or I, when I'm talking about ionized gas, I'm really talking about detecting the H alpha emission from it, um, also called Balmer alpha. Now it turns out that um, there's different uh, different ions, different uh, chemical elements can also produce other optical emission lines. Uh, so nitrogen can do this, sulfur can do this, oxygen can do this, and you can look at the brightness of the different lines to diagnose the radiation field. Um, so you can say, hmm, this you know this if n two to h alpha is high, maybe the radiation field is like this, but if it's low, maybe the radiation field is like that. And this, there's been a whole industry of astronomers basically classifying gas and classifying galaxies by these optical line ratios um, and then trying to infer their physical conditions. And so that leads us to uh, one of the things that drew me here the, to Wisconsin in the first place as a young postdoc, um, which is a project called the Wisconsin H Alpha Mapper. Um, this is actually a, a, a project that is still ongoing. Believe it or not, 20 years later, it's been funded for another three years of observations. Although the principal investigator has left Wisconsin, he's now Matt Hafner is now at Emory Riddle. And, um, and what you're seeing here um, is uh, just sort of a rotating image showing different directions of the galaxy and what the uh, ionized gas looks like. This is a little bit like the image I showed you at the very beginning of the talk, but in motion. Um, and, but what, what, what's also seen here is um, you're seeing different colors. And the different colors are, the, are basically the velocity resolved part of it. In other words, you see, you see ionized gas not just at a single velocity, but you see it at a range of velocities, um, and, and that produces a Doppler shift in the hydrogen alpha line. And we, so we can basically measure the brightness of H alpha as a function of velocity. And then if we know how gas moves in the galaxy, we can basically ascribe a distance to it. Um, so, um, so I think hopefully most of you know about the Doppler shift so that if you know, an object is moving away from you, it'll be shifted to slightly longer wavelengths, red shifted. And if it's moving towards you, it'll be shifted to slightly shorter wavelengths or bluer. And, uh, and if you look at the Milky Way galaxy and you assume that everything in the Milky Way moves in perfect circles, um, then, by the way, as I'm showing this, are you guys seeing yourselves? Or, uh, okay, I'm sorry about it. I was trying to do this, but it's not gonna work. Um, so anyway, so the, um, anyway the, uh, so basically you can convert a velocity into an estimated distance in the galaxy. So, so that's, that's all I'm gonna say about that because I wanna get to the next part. So with that little bit of background, let's talk about the, the other discovery I wanted to share, which is the discovery of what's called a liner in the inner Milky Way. Um, and actually, I'm gonna just quickly, 
stop share. And um, let me see if I can do this. Can I make a comment? Yeah. If you're, if you're seeing, if people are seeing on the right edge, they're seeing people. Uh, there is actually a, a, a setting in the on Windows on the top of the screen, uh, which allows you to get rid of side by side mode that gets rid of the people and you just see the screen. Well, I think the problem was I was sharing my entire screen and it was showing up on my screen. So actually, I think what I'm going to do. I, is... I, I, I wasn't getting that at all. I was oh, able okay. to get rid of those. Okay. Well, any rate. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about this discovery of the, of, of the Milky Way. Um, so zooming into the center of the galaxy. Um, so you zoom in um, to this region right here. Sort of, so this is, again, that optical starlight image. Um, behind all of that gas and dust, uh, we have the, the bar of the Milky Way galaxy. It's a collection of stars oriented diagonally. Um, this is actually showing the infrared light that gives you a sense of this. Uh, this is the midplane of the galaxy in white. Uh, this is the center of the, the center line of the galaxy uh, vertically. And you can see uh, a little bit that on the left hand side, uh, these contours of infrared light are slightly thicker than they are on the right. So can everyone sort of see that? And that's the effect of the bar. Um, that's actually the bar is nearer to us on the left side and further away from us on the right side. And so we're actually seeing a perspective effect um, where it gets smaller as it gets further away. And that actually tells you that you're seeing the bar. Um, and so, so the bar in the Milky Way image is represented like this. Um, there's modern data that actually Im improves on this. But the discovery I'm going to talk about is a discovery that we made in this direction. Okay. So uh, we have detected ionized gas in this direction. That doesn't seem like a lot, doesn't seem very interesting. Um, the reason we can see the ionized gas here is because uh, this is a section, a direction of the galaxy called Bada's window. Um, for whatever reason, there happens to be a direction towards the center of the galaxy where there's, very, there's actually not very much dust. And this provides a window for us to see into the center part of the Milky Way. Um, and so we detected this ionized gas. Now, the way we know it's at the center of the galaxy is because we can measure its Doppler shift. And so we know what the Doppler shifts are of gas in the center of the Milky Way, and this ionized gas shares it. And, um, and so we know we're seeing gas in the center of the Milky Way, um, and we're seeing this, um, this tilted distribution of gas. Um, there's actually, we know by looking at neutral gas that there's a sort of tilted disk in the center of the galaxy sort of embedded in the bar. Uh, by the way, the tilt is unexplained still uh, after decades of work, um, but it's there. It's definitely tilted. And we're detecting. And so the galaxy cooperated uh, with us in two very important ways. One is the gas in the very center of the galaxy is tilted. And that tilt happened to pass through that window of low extinction. And that, op that basically opened up the possibility for us to just study the ionized gas in the center of the galaxy. So I'm going to skip over these two things. So. So we can finally see this ionized gas in the center of the Milky Way and compare it to what we see in other galaxies. Um, and so that was the excitement of this project. Um, the first detection of ionized gas in any other galaxy was by uh, Edward Arthur Fath in 1909. But he was a professor at Carleton College in Minnesota, which is, I, I, I was an alumni of that place. I hadn't, I never heard of him until I started doing the research, but he was the first person to detect ionized gas in the galaxy. Uh, and then Milton Humason and Ni Nicholas Mayel, um, they actually then did surveys of ionized gas in galaxies because they were actually interested in looking at the Hubble flow, uh, the, the recession velocities of galaxies. But as a byproduct of that, they, were, they ended up studying the ionized gas in the centers of all these galaxies, finding that uh, the, the, some of these galaxies had unusual line ratios um, that basically line ratios of different, uh, like the nitrogen line to the hydrogen line, that were very different than what we saw in the Milky Way. Um, Guido Munch actually saw the same kind of gas in the center of Andromeda uh, in 1960. Um, and he found that there was this ionized gas in the center of the galaxy, even though there were, there were no hot stars. Remember I said that the ionized gas we thought comes from hot stars and their photons leaking out. Um, but that's, that there's ionized gas filling the center of the Andromeda galaxy and yet no, very little in the way of hot stars forming there. Um, and then finally, uh, Margaret Burbage and her husband, Jeffrey Burbage, together uh, did a survey of galaxies. And they found that 
that many galaxies in their centers were characterized by very high nitrogen to optical uh, to hydrogen line ratios. So there, were, there turned out to be a class of galaxies that had a very unusual optical line ratio that could not be produced by hot stars. Um, and so, uh, and so these, these things, even though we don't, uh, there's still arguments about what creates this kind of gas, this unusual ionization gas. Uh, so it was given the acronym LINER, which stands for Low Ionization Nuclear Emission Regions. Uh, although that's really just a placeholder name for something we don't understand. Uh, so um, in studying other galaxies, it became common to basically classify galaxies according to their so-called line ratios. So you looked at the N2 to H alpha, and you looked at O3 to H beta. These are just uh, different chemical elements and emission lines. And it was thought that stars, galaxies that, whose radiation field are dominated by star formation would lie here. Uh, galaxies that are dominated by a central black hole lie up here. Um, you have a sort of a, an in-between zone. But then the galaxies over here, the, so every point here, by the way, is the center of one galaxy. Um, but on the right-hand side, shaded in red, Galaxies over here are called liners, and we don't know what creates their ionization. Um, it's again, it's still there's many different hypotheses, but it doesn't seem to be hot young stars because there's not a lot of hot young stars in the centers of these galaxies. And so uh, the bottom line here, and oh my goodness, I didn't embed my image. Um, so the um, hmm, hold on a second. Uh, by the way, did I just dump out? Yeah, your screen, screen sharing is off. Okay, let me let me actually just do a um, rather than uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a movie and I'll just share that. Uh, so I'll show you I'll share with you the little uh, movie that we did um, uh, to explain what we're seeing here. So because uh, this was done by the way uh, as part of the thesis of uh, Danish Krishnaro, and uh, he did a fantastic job in in probing the center of the Milky Way this way. So uh, sharing again. And uh, there we go. OK, I'm going to go ahead and hit play. Enjoy the music, too. <laughs> this artist impression of the Milky Way shows the bar and spiral pattern scientists believe make up our galaxy. Within the central bar region, lies a mysterious structure called the tilted disk that is made of ionized gas. As we zoom into the position of Earth, just a small piece of this tilted disk is visible. It peeks out through a hole in the dust close to the center of our galaxy, allowing visible light to pass through. The tilted disk gets its name from its orientation that appears tilted compared with the rest of the Milky Way. Scientists have used WAM or the Wisconsin H alpha mapper to discover a faint red glow of light that is a telltale signature of ionized gas. By comparing other colors of visible light coming from ionized hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen, scientists can diagnose the source of ionization. They find that close to the nucleus of the galaxy, gas is ionized by newly forming stars. But as you move further away from the center, things get more extreme and the gas becomes similar to a class of galaxies called liners. This is much different than how gas outside the bar is classified. This mysterious type of gas has an unknown source of ionization and the Milky Way can now be used to better understand its nature. WAM and this research are funded by the National Science Foundation and the unique telescope is the only one in the world powerful enough to see the faint glow of the tilted disk. The research was led by scientists from the University of Wisconsin and Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University and is published in Science Advances. Okay, so that was our little explainer. Hopefully that, that probably did it better than I could do. Uh, and so let me just stop there and just, I have one tiny thing to say after this, but let's, let me stop there to see um, if uh, people have questions. <laughs> so, so to summarize that, um, the interesting thing about this observation is we're able to detect optical lines uh, from the center of our Milky Way in, in, in the same way that uh, people can observe the centers of other galaxies for the very first time. And we find that the line ratios indicate a radiation field 
that is unexplained in other galaxies as well. So our hope is that this will help us understand what's, you know, what is the nature of this radiation field that produces such unusual levels of ionization. Um, and so we're, we're continuing to do this. By the way, this is a bit of a breakthrough. We, we did not anticipate that we would be able to see ionized gas in the center of the Milky Way. Um, so we're now actually, when uh, galactic center season starts in a few months, uh, we plan to go to town and basically observe as much as we can towards the center of the Milky Way in as in many different emission lines as we can to try to make progress on this. Um, so at any rate, um, are there any questions yet? And otherwise I'll share one last thing. Okay. Bob, actually I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, what instruments are you using or going to use to do the observations this summer? Uh, so the only, basically we're using the only game in town, which is the Wisconsin H Alpha Mapper. Um, so, so this is the only telescope that can detect this very faint optical emission lines, um, but with a velocity resolution necessary for us to confirm that it's at the center of the galaxy. So, so this telescope that was built in Wisconsin over 20 years ago now, is still the only game in town to do this kind of research. Thank you. Sure. Anyone else? Where is WAM located, Bob? Um, well, WAM was initially located at a Saratil uh, sorry at a Kitt Peak um, near Tucson. Uh, so it did it did it surveyed the, the 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 section of sky visible from the northern hemisphere from Kitt Peak. Um, then it was disassembled and moved down to Saratololo in Chile, um, and so. So it's been observing in Chile for the last like 10, 12 years. Um, we did have a lapse in funding um, where they, they, we weren't able, it had to be shut down for about a year, um, but it's been refunded. And uh, luckily uh, Saratolo doesn't charge us rent if we're not observing. And uh, so we're, we're gonna be able to start it back up and re start reobserving soon. So anyone else? Okay, the last thing I want to mention, and I'll be this will be a short one, um, is that that discovery of this this ionized gas in the center of the galaxy made us realize that we could detect ionized gas in the center of the galaxy, and there's another structure in the center of the Milky Way um, that has been uh, observed, um, and and so we decided to see if we could detect it, um, and so let me just quickly share my screen one last time. Um, so some of you may have heard of this. Um, it's called the Fermi bubble. Um, so there is, uh, if you look at the center of the galaxy, and this is a, basically an all-sky image, um, and you look right towards the center you, in, in gamma rays, you see these what looks like two lobes of gamma ray emission coming out of the very center of the Milky Way galaxy. Um, this is speculated to be an outflow coming from the supermassive black hole basically coming, somehow getting out through this disk of ionized gas that we're seeing, um, and then punching above and below the galaxy. And so it's illustrated here sort of in this artist picture. Uh, so, you know, basically it would be a giant structure in the sky. Um, and, and so it's again, faint uh, in terms of its optical emissions. But what we did is we said, wow, if this thing exists, um, let us point the WAM telescope, the Wisconsin H Alpha Mapper, in a direction where we already see ionized gas, and um, and but not in emission, but in absorption. So basically, looking at very distant quasars, um, the light from that quasar passes through this Fermi bubble on the way to us, and we can see um, the absorption of of, of uh, absorption lines uh, due to the Fermi bubble. So this is actually done by a former UW Madison grad, uh, Andy Fox, and uh, and so we decided to point our telescope, the WAM, uh, to see if we could see the H alpha emission associated with this absorption, and we did. Um, and so we basically have done the very first optical um, emission line observations of this gas that we think is coming out of a giant outflow from the center of the Milky Way. Um, so, so this is this would if this works. I mean, we have to continue to map it to see if this if it's if it ends up being what we expect. But if this works, we'll actually be able to get a sense of the explosion that has happened in the center of the galaxy that created this Fermi bubble. And for our initial results, but just by comparing the emission and the absorption, we find that this is consistent. Uh, this idea of an explosion is consistent with our measurements. We find evidence of very high pressures, uh, very high uh, medium high velocities. 
Uh, so something that is um, something that is dense and highly pressurized coming out of the center of the Milky Way. And so it's just another hint of one of the things we were able to do with WAM before we had to shut it down for a year and something that we will hope to start up again um, in the next few months. So, um, so I'm going to stop there. Uh, so to just summarize, uh, I'm not going to show a summary slide, but to just summarize, um, you know, we found an ionized arc in the sky of a nearby explosion. We find ionized gas in the very center of the Milky Way, whose line ratios um, are unusual for anywhere else in the Milky Way, but very commonly seen in the centers of other galaxies. And we think we've got a handle now on ionized gas coming from the center of the Milky Way in an explosion uh, that also created the so-called Fermi bubble. And, uh, and that's really just a, the beginning of the story. We published our single detection, the one we were able to squeeze in just before we had to turn down the, shut down the telescope. So, uh, so that's, that's the end of my talk. So thank you again for your attention. Great, thanks, Bob. Amber, go ahead. Yeah, so this is actually Matt on my wife. I'm using my wife's account, Amber's my wife. So <laughs> Bob, thanks a lot for your presentation. I enjoyed it. Um, I was curious though, so I know we peeked through a hole in uh, some of the other uh, like dust and stars to see that um, ionized gas at the center of the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. I was kind of curious how we discern the rest of the shape of that tilted disk, because it looks like a lot of that was behind some significant um, right. debris, I guess, as well call it. Yeah, that, that tilted distribution of gas um, is actually also seen in neutral gas. Um, so you can use the hydrogen 21 centimeter, or it's a radio wavelength. Um, so back in the, um, in the late 1970s, uh, they, they, they developed a model of the, the neutral gas distribution. And it turns out the ionized gas we're seeing exactly matches the velocity of the neutral gas. Um, so we, we used the, the knowledge of the neutral gas to build our complete model. And, uh, and we did find that um, with the model that we built, um, the only places where we could detect the, the H-alpha emission is where we did detect the H-alpha emission. But, but we do think that we're just seeing a tip of the iceberg, that a lot of there's, there's still a lot of ionized gas behind the dust that we can't see. Okay, thank you. And we just opened up now. Anybody who wants to ask, ask a question, feel free to unmute and go for it. Aftar, why don't you go next? Okay. Um, hello, Bob. That was spectacular. Thank you very much. It's very, very interesting. Um, my question is, what would the Fermi bubble or bubbles look like from outside the galaxy? Would they resemble anything like the jets of M82? Yeah, we think they would resemble the jets, but basically be much, much fainter and probably a little wider. Um, the, uh, the, so, but, but there actually have been some attempts to find Fermi bubble analogs in other galaxies. So far, not successfully. Um, so, so, um, but, but yeah, the bottom line is it would be a lobe that's sort of, you know, the, basically the, the height of the Fermi bubble is actually even longer than the bar. So, so if, you, if you think of the picture of the Milky Way show with the bar, something that's even longer than that, but oriented vertically. Um, it's, it would, but, it, but because it's, it, it definitely would be low density. So it'd be sort of this ghostly blobs above and below the galaxy, uh, you know, roughly, uh, what is it? Uh, I guess about 5,000 lights, you know, more, more like 8,000. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Bob. Sure. I have I have one um, the the strangely shaped uh, can't hear I think you're gonna... the question is that that one lobe is heading north is there any idea that there's a lobe also heading heading south because an asymmetric design like that's a little bit unusual yeah no actually there there is evidence um, that that you basically have both a northern and southern lobe. I mean the the gamma ray emission hinted at it. I mean although the northern lobe is stronger, um, but actually I mentioned that 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 X-ray telescope Eurocita, um, they just recently published a paper showing a, a southern and a northern lobe in in X-ray emission. Um, now do we have it in H alpha? Um, well we haven't. Um, we have some unreduced preliminary data, um, but we were waiting to, for the telescope to go back online to, to cover, the, cover the section of the, of, the low, of the Fermi bubble below the galactic plane. 
to be honest, we should be able to see that stuff better because there's less dust. Um, and, and there are some um, AG, uh, absorption line targets in those directions as well. So that is definitely on the to-do to list. Um, but so far as we can tell, it does seem to be a symmetric structure based on X-ray emission. Also, the, the dust, the, the holes in the dust, I'm curious, is, is that a random process? Do the, people think it's a random process or is there actually something that happened to blow a hole in the dust? Um, in the case of the, the Bada window, um, the, we think it's just chance. You know, there just happens to be a direction where there was no cloud. I mean, because of course, you know, you're looking for a long path through the galaxy. So you just have to be lucky that to find a place where there's not dust lying along the way. It would be hard to have anything that created that hole because that, that thing would have to link, go the entire length of the galaxy. Hey, Bob, um, that, um, the two lobes of the uh, Fermi bubble, are they believed to be centered on this uh, the galactic central black hole? Yeah, I mean the 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 general the going theory is that this is these are basically lobes that were created by a earlier explosion um, from the central black hole. I mean it's certainly it's certainly consistent with that because these two lobes are centered on the center of the galaxy, um, but but it's been hard to trace them all the way down to the to the black hole. So so they they line up with the black hole, but you can't really trace them all the way down to the black hole. So maybe when our nucleus, our galactic nucleus, was a bit more active, I mean, would some of these mechanics be, you know, similar to what we observe in quasars? Right. Yeah, you could sort of think of it as a, as a not quite a quasar kind of event. Uh, that the Milky Way had an event where enough material spiraled into the black hole that it created an outflow, a double lobed outflow, uh, but not to cr not to sustain for a jet for a long time. So. Yeah, the fair, by the way, I, I should say, I have been the biggest Fermi bubble skeptic. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I actually, I, I thought it's so trendy. I don't want to believe it. I mean, it's, I don't see it in anything else. And I, I honestly, um, you know, and, and when people were uh, seeing absorption lines and interpreting the Fermi bubble, I was like, can they really do that? But then when we got the, com the combination of our emission lines and their absorption lines, I'm not sure it's the Fermi bubble, but it's definitely galactic center because it's very high pressured. Um, so, so it, there's definitely high pressure gas in the center of the galaxy. And for right now, the going theory is that, that all that gas is above and below the plane is associated with the Fermi bubble outflow. So, so I'm, when you gradually, say, oh. I'm gradually being convinced by my own data. <laughs> when you say high pressure, uh, can you throw a number on there just so we can kind of relate? Oh, you know, I'm so used to thinking of an interstellar pressure. Um, probably the pressures I'm talking about are lower than the pre than the best vacuums on Earth. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> that's what I was kind of curious about. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean you have to rescale all your understandings of density and pressure to work in the interstellar medium. Um, let's see, the pressures are the p over k's are ten to the five. Yeah, that would be that might be lower than the best the pressure and the best vacuum we've achieved on Earth. But, wow. But for interstellar pressures, uh, it's actually a significantly large number. So. How useful, how useful are galactic jets as uh, histograms of activity of the galactic nu nuclei? Well, I mean, we think when we look at other galaxies, you know, when you see these jets, you know that something's going on. Um, the, prob the problem is, is that when they become sporadic, um, you have to figure out how to, um, you know, when you see just sort of blobs that have separated, you know, you do see actually radio jets where you see a blob that is clearly separated. So there's been bursts of, 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 of outflows. Um, and so, so the, they're indicative of, pre of previous action, but it's sort of hard to diagnose the history of that action, so. I guess it must depend on at least two things, right? One is the size of the supermassive black hole, and two is the amount of material available for feeding uh, the jets, because those two would combine to give you an estimate of just the size of the jets and how much energy there is in them. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. And then a third factor to add to that is the, the structure of the gas around the galaxy in the first place. Um, in other words, if a galaxy has been very good at clearing out a lot of the material, then the jet is free to go into very low density areas. Whereas if, if the galaxy is only, has only had a burst once, there might be a lot of material to push out of the way. So it's, it, that's, that's that last factor is what makes it sometimes complex to interpret these jets. So, so Bob, um, a few years ago, I read in <clears throat> Scientific American an article about um, a st structures that the author called um, galactic chimneys. Mm -hmm. And these appeared to be um, outflows perpendicular to the plane of the galaxy, but not from the center, right? They were scattered around the arms. Do you have any um, ideas on how those st structures interact with the lobes you've been discussing? Yeah, that, uh, you can sort of consider the lobes as, a, as an extreme centralized version of a chimney. Yeah, I mean, basically, when you have a, a, a group of supernovae uh, go off s near the same time, which happens because massive stars form in groups, and massive stars are the ones that create supernovae. And so you can sometimes get two, three, four, 10, 20 supernovae all going off successively. And that punches a hole in the galaxy and, and vents the material in these so called galactic chimneys. Um, the thing is that that develops over a longer period of time. I mean, a, a supermassive, the feeding the, the supermassive black hole in the Milky Way could be a, a much shorter term event and a much higher energy event. Um, actually, AGN or uh, black, black hole feeding is a very highly energy efficient process. Um, and so, so essentially, you get a, a, ideally, you get a better defined geometry and a, and a more explosive outflow than the, in the so-called galactic chimneys. That's great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Fermi bubbles. The, they are, the, you say they're about 50,000 light years tall. Mm -hmm. How old is the top of the bubble? Um, that's a good question. I honestly, the answer to answer that question requires knowing what the expansion velocity was. And I don't remember. So I, I can't tell you right now. So. But, but I'm, I'm sure if you were to Google Fermi bubble, you'll find some some articles on this. So there's, it's been a lot of it's been interesting to a lot of people from for the last maybe ten years or so. That's interesting. I, I guess what Jürgen's asking is, um, are they relativistic structures? Are they moving at frac large fractions of the speed oh. of light? Oh no 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 yeah we don't think it. We we think that the, the things we see are not 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 relativistic because that would be that would be more jet like. Um, so they, they're 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 things that have expanded and then slowed down, but we still see the shell of material that it created. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah. Any further questions for Bob? Yeah, great presentation. Thank you so much. I mean, this, this is a lot of fun, different ways to think about the, the galaxy, whether we're talking in our nearby neighborhood or the center of the galaxies is a lot of fun new concepts to, to think about and talk to each other about. Thank you so much for sharing them. Sure. It's great having you here. Oh, thank you. It was, it was my pleasure. And yeah, and I mean, I guess I should should say, you know, whenever you look at the at space pictures and you see that that reddish glow in space, that's H alpha. So so we study that same glow, but in a very low density environment. So so it's it turns out it turns out there are surprises even now. So so thanks again for your attention. It was nice spending the evening with you all. Thanks, Bob. That was great. Thank, thank you, Bob. Great stuff. Bye bye. Thank you. Well, all right, everybody, I guess that'll wrap it up for uh, this month's meeting. And we look forward to seeing everyone again on online next month on uh, uh, March 12th. And don't forget about the special presentation the evening before on Thursday, uh, March 11th. So yeah, we'll send out, we'll make sure that everybody gets all the uh, links that they need to be able to join us for those presentations. All right, thanks, Bob. Thanks, everybody.